Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? So, um, I'm Jonathan. I'm a partner at Molten. And before we start, I'll play a little propaganda video about us. Great. So let me tell you a bit more about what we do at, uh, at Molten, because as, as Tommy said, I think we are in a pretty good position to talk about the fundraising journey from pre-seed to, to late stage, because we are involved every step of the way. Um, in a nutshell, what we do is very simple. We uh, inject into the most visionary entrepreneurs and company the energy they need to transform and grow. And that energy comes in very different forms. Uh, and we do that with a very unique model. Um, we are a public company. We're listed on FTSE 250, which means that we have a capital permanent and patient model, which is very important for entrepreneurs because we know that scaling a company from seed to series B and C and beyond takes a lot of time. And the truth is companies stay private longer in, in Europe. And, and the beauty about our model is that our shareholders actually don't want the capital back. They want us to deploy it, and they have helped us to deploy between 150 and 200 million pounds a year since 2016, recognizing that you know, scaling a business takes time and, and capital. So supporting our companies throughout their life cycle has always been uh, a key for us, and a testament to that is the portfolio of unicorn that we have, such as Trustpilot, UiPath, Graphcore, Revolut, Kazoo, and Ledger, and some of them are investment from 2012 to 2013. So we've been able to support this company. Trustpilot is a very good example, from seed to basically uh, an exit. But of course, our portfolio is not only about unicorns. Uh, it's about providing this energy to any CISIS-driven founders uh, with a bold vision, the ambition to disrupt a market, that have found a product market fit and that we believe have a model that can scale, but most importantly, that are laser focused on executing, and that is working from any stage. Uh, an example of that portfolio includes, basically our portfolio has 67 companies. I mentioned the, the, you know, the biggest companies, uh, but we also have um, companies like Mana, which is an Irish drone delivery company, uh, we just invested in a quantum computing software business called Riverlane in the UK. Uh, and I can also mention the latest climate uh, investment, such as Servest, and, uh, and also a Finnish company, a satellite company called IceEye. So we go from you know, very small to very big, but we also invest in, uh, in seed funds. Sorry, I should uh, actually show you the slide here. We also invest in, in, in seed funds. We started that program in 2017 with the idea that you know, doing early stage and pre-seed and seed deals directly is very difficult for us. So instead of doing it directly, why wouldn't we do it through uh, early stage fund managers who we believe are the best in Europe? And so we started the program in 2017 and today we have about 60 fund managers. Um, that have invested in about 900 companies. And the beauty of that is that it's a two-way street for us. We send those early stage business that we like to them, and they came back to us two years later, where they are of the size or shape that we need to, to, to invest. Uh, and as part of that, we have um, those, those guys, Seedcamp, of course, Icebreaker, a local fund, Hardware Club, and Buy Founders, which is based in Copenhagen. And, and the idea is, is both trying to back local fund managers 
Um, I think it's very important to have feet on the ground when it comes to seed, but also thesis-driven managers, thematics, and we've tried to do a bit of both. Um, you must have noticed also that we have rebranded recently. Uh, let me tell you a bit about that. Uh, over the past five years, this company has been through a considerable journey of change. Between a change in leadership uh, and also scaling the business, we have transformed into a very different beast from what we were when we first listed on AIM and Euronext in June 2016, which, by the way, was five days before Brexit. Well, that's a story for another day. And today, we're really moving away from having a few key players to a fully built-out and scaled team that is now listed on, on, on the FTSE 250. And our market cap today is about 1.5 billion pounds, which is to compare with the 120 million that we had when we first listed in 2016. So with that, you know, we thought that the time uh, had come to do something fresh. We wanted a brand that embodied you know, who we are, how we operate, and, and you know, that reflects our, our strategy, which is you know, to transform businesses. And I think that's what we found in, in, in Molten. You know, it's a brand that is not only bef befitting of where we are, but reflects our ambition as a, you know, a leader of a new generation of, uh, of tech VCs. So our name was inspired by a natural um, process of state change, by which matter is transformed via the injection of energy. And that is this energy that I was talking about that we bring in many different forms to entrepreneurs. It's capital, it's knowledge, it's experience, it's relationship, and it's commitment. So today we're going to talk about the fundraising journey from uh, seed to, to growth. And I think it's a very ambitious subject to talk about in 25 minutes. So bear with me, I will try to do my best. And you, could download, you can download or ask this presentation, actually, if you write to this email address, because there are a few slides that I believe uh, need to be taken offline. So what do we mean by seed, Series A, Series B, etc.? One way to look at it is to consider the amount of money invested um, in the companies. But this is very variable, and it's changing also. It's increasing. If you look at the round sizes, you will see that they have inflated considerably over the last few years. I think everybody is aware of this. Companies raise more money, but they raise also more money more quickly. Uh, the velocity of those rounds has, has increased. Interestingly here, you will see that the size of Series A and B deals involve pretty much the same amount in the UK, in, the U, in, in Europe, and in the US, which I think is quite, uh, quite interesting. Of course, there is still a disparity in valuations, which is why you know, US investors are coming here in Europe to invest in our, in our companies to benefit from this arbitrage. But I think the most important thing here is if you look at the amount of capital that is deployed in venture in 21 year to date, it's not on this slide. In the US, it's about 200 billion euros, give or take. We are in Europe between 75 and 80. But I think what is interesting is not the numbers, but it's the share of you know, the US, uh, the Euro um, VC industry compared to the US, which has gone from 26% to 38%. So we're catching up. And if you exclude the mega deals, it's even more, uh, more telling. Um, so um, the next slide, this is quite an interesting one, and I invite you to take it offline. I'm trying here to compare the different phases of a company's life with one of a human being, from really embryo to mature or grown-up. And every, actually, category has a, a sort of a, of, a, of a stage, from you know, friends and family, love money, seed, series A, series B, series C. Um, you, can, you can look at it offline, but what I want to talk about here is, um, no matter where you sit here, in my opinion, entrepreneurs are basically the only time travelers that I know. Um, if you think about the situation, most people live in the present. The future is an extension of the present. And entrepreneurs forecast basically a different version of the present, an enhanced and augmented version of the present with technology. So what does success mean? What does winning mean? Um, winning means, in my opinion, that entrepreneurs can break free of the present and fast track the future. Historically, if you look at how many of the tech leaders of this world, um, where they started, I think it's very interesting to observe that often those category-defining companies were started in a period of crisis or chaos, uh, where the need to break free was even more obvious. But they didn't do that naturally. 
It's not coincidental. Uh, it was because what happened were inflection points, or what I call trigger points, or paradigm shift. And you could say, for instance, that cost of AI computation is one variable. You could say that access to mass audience is one variable, or remote working today, or the passion economy emerging. And usually the adoption curve follows, you know, recently, it's been observed with a network effect, when a network effect meets software, that in a digital world, everything happens more quickly. And the common success factor here, if there is such a thing, I don't think there is a recipe for success, um, but there are common factors. And I think what is interesting uh, from that perspective is the ability from entrepreneurs to understand those inflection points and leverage them, capitalize on them, and force the incumbents to rather react than the other way around, uh, which has been the status quo so far. Um, so, uh, in a way, you know, at early stage or even at late stage, it's not about investing early or late in a company. It's about backing an insight. It's about building a mindset to trust founders to ride on that insight and create the breakthrough. So, if we think about stages, I think, you know, one way to think about it would be the breakthrough sequence. You know, there is three steps. Insight breakthrough, we just talked about it, product breakthrough, and growth breakthrough. So, at seed, what is important is to get out of the present, you know, start with a great insight, break free from competition. What can we do that is unique and that consumers are desperate for? Uh, monopolize the mind share of the early believers in that market with a view of achieving this total global e hegemony. Have that in mind. This is more the product breakthrough. Uh, and the last one is the growth breakthrough, which is really like the late stage. How do you go from 10 or 20 million of ARR to, to the next phase, which is 100 million? Um, it's a very different, um, different looking beast. So let's talk about seed investing, which is the first um, slide of our topic. So, the first thing I would like to say here is it's very confusing when you're talking about seed. What does seed mean? You know, the landscape for early stage investing looks entirely different today than it did a few years ago. Uh, and I think the reason for that is Series A investors today are now looking for more and more traction before leading a large Series A round. And, and frankly, institutional seed investors have kind of followed suit. Um, increasingly investing only in companies with some demonstrable success um, in the market. And, and, and because institutional seed investors are funding slightly more mature companies, I think what happened is that a new pre-seed category has emerged to fund companies much earlier uh, with a, a blank check uh, based on a team and this insight, which I, I just mentioned. And, and that money basically helps the company to get to the next seed level, which is, could be classified as post-seed or seed extension. You know? And those rounds are to help the companies meet the more aggressive milestone that they require for Series A. Um, and, and, and we'll talk about that. But, but so in terms of milestone, what do you need um, to, to get when you're, you're a seed business? Those numbers are not an exact science. They're more like, um, like an indication. I don't think they are hard and fast benchmarks for, um, you know, to clear. But there are ballpark estimates which, which, which are important. Uh, you, you can take this offline, but, but I think, you know, for true seed, VC pre-seed or angel seed rounds, you know, what you want to see is some e initial evidence that there is a product market fit. I mean, this is what we're asking to those uh, companies very early on, right? Um, sure, if you have from 250 to 1 million revenue run rate, it's, it's better. Uh, but if you want to raise a, a seed round and you start with 10 or 50K of MRR, that is enough to prove that, you know, the concept is working. Um, this is about uh, proving your, your, your market. And, and the thing that also I would like to mention is investors don't always look at top-line metrics, you know. Uh, high potential teams with a really good product market fit, a large and attractive market opportunity, and a business model that can scale, you know, is, is also something that we need to look at. Top-line metrics are good indicators of success, but they're not the one bar to clear to, 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 to fast track your, your fundraising round. I think the hardest part to do basically is to create a company that is fundable, team, product, organization, sales, and you do that while trying to understand what the other end think, the money, the, in, the investors. Um, but I think the most important thing here is 
always have your Series A in mind if you are a seed investor, because the way you're positioning your business is necessarily to hit the next milestone. And the point is that every prior success depends of the success of the next phase. Uh, it's a hindsight industry. And I think the most important thing is to keep that in mind. Of course, um, there's many types of companies. If you are a SaaS business, investors will ask you to, to show some, some MRR. If you are a deep tech business, it's more about product. So that's why I'm saying there's not one formula. It's just about understanding what the other parts mean. So let's move to Series A. Series A is a very different um, situation. This is, again, about product breakthrough and, and market. And here, what people will focus on is more the opportunity, you know, the scale of your total addressable market. What problem are you solving? And are you doing it in a unique and defensible way? So it's, um, it's, it's again, knowing what Series A investors are looking for. Uh, it's, it's more than product market fit at this point. It's really, you know, does the market want your product and, and your customers? And it's more than simply paying for customers. It's about engagement. It's about returning customers. It's about number of active users. It's about frequency of usage. It's about activation rates. It's about, if you're a website, page views or session times. Um, it's about churn. Churn needs to be under control. Of course, if you have a negative net retention and you're losing more customers than you're signing up, this cannot work. It's about strong organic growth. Uh, it's about showing repeatability of sales at this point. So through the journey of finding your product market fit, you have most likely at this point identified your ICP, ideal customer profile, who needs or wants your product and you know how they buy it. And that's how you can basically tailor your marketing strategy. Um, uh, the proof also of attracting strong talent, I think that's very important at Series A. If you want to scale from now on, this is definitely about people. Um, so investors would also look at that. Um, and, and the question is, is what, what do you need? Um, again, Series A rounds can happen with more modest numbers than what is mentioned here. I think what is more important that the absolute value is the gross. Is it going fast? And Look, if there is a belief that your product or what you do has hit a nerve or is leading to almost like an addictive user behavior or, or natural virality, I think, in my opinion, that beats top line growth. You know, it's just about funding something that works. Um, so again, like for, for a seed round, um, and, and this is only me talking, the top line is not what matters most. It is important, of course, but it's more about virality and, and how your customer engage with your product uh, every day. Um, you know, a company with hundreds of daily active users uh, but no revenue when raising a Series A, uh, in my opinion, is, is, is likely to unlock considerable shareholder value. Um, so, yeah, because this product can be built with pretty modest early capital and they're coming to Series A, we are often also seeing cases where large Series A rounds, uh, investors have rolled the dice again and, uh, and invest in people that invest in those founders pre-launch. It's just sort of a new category emerging, which you could call, you know, pre-Series A or Series A, but those rounds are, are, are quite big and the relative dollar or pound risk or euro risk is small, but the payoff is usually huge. So uh, you see now large funds playing that game of, uh, of entering to Series A, which I think is, is, is quite an interesting trend. So um, anything that I haven't mentioned here? Yeah, no, I think we've covered everything. Um, series B. Uh, again, uh, different beast here. Series B is usually the critical round on the path to global hegemony or becoming truly global. But it's also often the most challenging round to raise. Um, it must be said that at this point, if your business is going in the right direction, you should be on the radar screen of all the VCs out there. So it's not so much about finding you know, the right investor for you, which is, by the way, crucial at early stage, right? Um, a good valuation is important, don't get me wrong, but I think picking the right investor is even more important. This is 
probably also true at Series B. But at this point, uh, you, you should be on the radar screen of those guys. Uh, because, well, because you've been growing fast, um, the growth rates of the company that we see at Series B now, this is a bit uh, aggressive, but definitely more than 40, 50% a year. And when you go into that category, you become attractive for, for those guys. But, but the round is about pouring fuel into a working engine. This is not about improving the business anymore. It's about scaling, and it's about scaling rapidly, uh, accelerate growth. And that, therefore, for that reason, investors will be much more metrics driven. I was saying that for seed or Series A, perhaps top line growth is not what matters the most. Here, it starts to become the case because you need to prove that you can win, you can win the market. So what do you need to show at Series B to, um, to be attractive? Well, I think the most important thing is that you need to show a path to becoming market leader. Now is the time to show that you can, you can become this category-defining company and that you have the commercial engine to do so and that you can scale. So sales and marketing, obviously, are going to be super key at this stage. Efficiency, for instance, of your QBH, quota bearing heads versus the OTAs. This is the kind of thing that we check a lot because, uh, again, it's not about proving that it works. It's about you know, showing that it works. Um, we will look at a lot of, uh, of the CAC uh, metrics by channel, sales cycles. This is a point where you're starting really to look at LTV and uh, margin per customer. You look at what you were you know, doing at Series A, and you see if that has improved. Uh, again, sales efficiency is, is, is the most important thing, and, and, and unique economics have to be profitable. This is about growth at any cost. It's also about competition. Um, the market is becoming narrower at this point, and, uh, and it's about winning. It's about talent. It's always about talent. Uh, you know. Uh, but here, it's, 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 you probably have built a strong senior management team. This is about the other C-levels and, and the VPs. You have to know your gaps. You have to understand how to fill them. And you also have to show employee retention. This is something that personally I look at. Can a company retain its talents as opposed to signing new talents? I think it's equally uh, interesting. I've got to watch for time. Um, so um, raising growth. Uh, well, there's a lot of advice out there about how you can do that and how you can pitch your startup during your growth round. That's not what I'm going to do here. What I'm going to do here is talk about the process because specifically, you know, um, the behind the seed process of preparing a company for a successful growth round strategy. Um, you don't have to do this. Some companies you know, skip the, the growth round to go directly to, to IPO or trade sale. Um, but but the, 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 the important part here is that it's a much, complex, much more complex project when you're at this level. You know? It touches every part of your business. And, and, and also, the enemy here is that it will compete with your attention as you're building your company. So I think this is something that you have to keep in mind. A growth round takes between six and nine months, and, uh, and that's time that you take your eyes off your business. Um, the best way to do that is to manage the fundraising process the same way you carefully manage your, your, your business. The challenge is that you have to do it while in a race against time. So what will investors prioritize for, for this? I think it's, it's basically a pinch that is highly convincing. It communicates how your product is already winning in what is a large market, or you have a clear path to leadership in that market. It's just an amount, a matter of time. Of course, clean financial, you've got to show growth, you've got to show that you know, you, 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 you're showing the vital signs of, of success, growth, churn, efficiency. You have to show that you have a business that is not burning cash anymore or it's under control. There is a path to profitability. That's certainly what IPO investors are, are, are requesting today. Um, but you also want to show, and again, this is again about talent. Here, it's going to be one of the duty diligence items of your investors. Can you attract and retain talent? I would strongly advise you to also think about timing um, because sequential quarter growth is very important for a growth round. Uh, you don't want a choppy quarter to uh, impact your fundraising. Investors will look at the growth quarter over quarter as opposed to year on year before. 
um, and, and have a, 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 an easy story to tell. Complexity can kill a growth story. It's not because you have a much more complex business that your pitch needs to be more complex. And, um, and uh, yeah, and, and last thing, I think, you know, um, just, just explain how you're going to change the world because at this point, uh, it's really about that. You are one step away from, you know, global leadership and, uh, and that's what you need to convey to, to investors. I think I'm running out of time, but thank you very much. And you can download these slides from, uh, from the Slush website or request them at the following address. Thank you.